please join me in welcoming to the stage Professor Tim Spector. Thank you very much, and thanks very much for coming out tonight to uh, chat about all things nutrition, microbes, etc., and listen to really pretty much the first time I've given a, a public talk about uh, my new book. So it's very exciting, and you're going to be guinea pigs. And uh, I, you'll have to remind me what's on my slides and everything. So um, uh, as I'm making this up, but it's. What I really want to do in this very short time is really run through some of the new ideas and some of the, uh, what I've learned really in this six years that it took me to, to write the latest book, and, um, which is called The Food, Food for Life. And it's a, it's a big book, bigger than anything else I've done before, so I can't possibly cover all of it, but I am hope that by giving you a few examples and also um, having a Q&A afterwards, we can get a dip into it, just so you understand the way I've been thinking about things. And the, for those of you who don't know me, um, I started life as a medical doctor, a rheumatologist, uh, treating arthritis and back pain, doing some research, and then I got interested in epidemiology, study of diseases, and did my thesis on arthritis and the menopause and HRT, and then in 1993 uh, set up the twin study, the UK twin study, and which is the largest of its kind in the world, and we have 16,000 twins, and been doing that for 30 years. And I was very happily doing genetic type work, finding genes, um, and uh, got very excited by this nature of e nurture argument. But I think it all changed back in 2011 when I was doing some hiking uh, up a mountain, uh, ski touring, and uh, at the end of the last day, at 3,000 meters, I suddenly felt very unwell and got double vision. And it turned out I had also very high blood pressure. And it turned out I had a, a small occlusion in uh, the artery supplying the uh, nerves to the eye, and it was like a sort of micro stroke, if you like. Uh, it resolved, but it left me suddenly being like one of my patients who had all these tablets and was worried about heart disease and hypertension and worrying about their weight and all kinds of things. So I started to say, what can I do for myself lifestyle wise because tablets are one thing that's easy to get but what else should I be doing what should I be doing exercise what should I do for my diet and as a doctor I'd never really been taught anything about nutrition still most doctors are not taught about nutrition compared to tablets and drugs and so I started looking at the internet and basically um, what I saw then hasn't really changed much 10 years later. It's still count your calories. It's still all calories are equal. Still, eat, avoid high fat foods. Eat starchy foods instead, starchy carbs. Have a big proportion of your diet with those on your eat well plate. Never skip a meal, eat little and often, and exercise because that's good for weight loss. And of course, one diet fits all. And the only problem with these simple-to-remember NHS guidelines is they're rubbish. <laughs> and there's no evidence to back them up, and it's really sad that this is still uh, the evidence that uh, healthy, patient, healthy people and patients have still got today. Now, it doesn't mean that all the things they say on the NHS website is wrong. It just means that there's a lot that's wrong, and there's 50% correct and there's 50% wrong. But it leaves people uh, really not knowing what to do. And you've, if you believe those, you think, okay, well, if I just walk a bit more, I'll lose weight, and all I've got to do is eat less fat and eat more starchy foods. That, that, those two public health messages have basically uh, tripled the amount of obesity in the last 40 years. 
So a third of the UK population is now pre-diabetic or diabetic, and uh, we're moving towards about a third of children being obese. So clearly, something's gone wrong, and we need to have an another way of looking at it. And it was about uh, just after this that I, I, I got really interested in the gut microbiome, which was not big here at all, but in the US there were people starting to study it. And essentially, uh, gut microbes were something we were talked about. You might remember when we, in, about this time, they discovered, um, there was a bit before this, about Helicobacter. Those of you who might have had an ulcer or might remember, Helicobacter um, suddenly replaced the old thinking about ulcers. Ulcers, before then, were thought to be due to stress. Stress and these nerves which were over putting out too much acid. And so there was this huge industry of people uh, going to a hospital, getting their vagus nerve cut and the nerves to the stomach cut as a way of treating ulcers. It didn't work. It made a lot of surgeons rich. And uh, it was, you know, old-fashioned medicine without any real science behind it. And it was only when they discovered that it was due to this microbe, Helicobacter, causing the ulcers, that they eliminated it, and basically ulcers have become a really minor problem now treated by GPs rather than by surgeons. But at that time, Helicobacter um, was thought to be just an annoying microbe. It turns out that when you get rid of it by overuse of antibiotics, it does cause some other problems. So you actually get some extra cancers in those people who've had their Helicobacter removed. And some other conditions are more common. So that was the first time I'd ever heard microbes actually might be helpful. And this is, you know, about 12 years ago. And that's really interesting because now, in the last five years, I think it's pretty much mainstream that people realize that, yes, our microbes are helpful to us. But it wasn't, it wasn't obvious uh, back then. And we have this huge community of gut microbes that are about the same number of microbes in our guts as we have cells in our body. So we, some people say we're 50-50, we're, we're you know, we're half alien, half human. And every time we go to the toilet, we actually become more human because <laughs> half of them go down the pan. But most of them are these bacteria and related species called archaea, but there's actually five times as many viruses eating off the bacteria. So it's a really confusing area in there, and there's fungi in there, and there's parasites. And six years ago, we would, we would have tried to kill off those parasites and, and fungi, but now we know they're beneficial. And the way I like to think about these now is not as what they used to be called commensal microbes, but as these are they're like mini pharmacies. They're producing chemicals for us, producing thousands of different chemicals that include vitamins, uh, neurochemicals, um, immune reacting chemicals, anti-aging chemicals, anti-inflammatory chemicals, everything. So if you think about it in that way, it gives a little new perspective really on this new biology, this new science about why it's so important to us to look after our gut microbes. So that was really what the diet myth, my first book in this area was about, was introducing the gut microbes to people in a way they could understand, and re-looking really at uh, food in, in the context of the gut microbiome. So suddenly, it's like we discovered a new liver. And all these old stories about how food is supposed to work um, didn't really make sense but it sort of starts to make sense when you think of how it's interacting with your gut microbes, which is this new uh, organ in our bodies. And particularly important is the fact that it's the main driver of our immune system, which means it's not just our digestive system that it's important for, not just breaking down local stuff, but it, the immune system is all over the body, and most of our immune cells are in the gut. So this interaction means that a good microbiome means a good immune system means preventing food allergies, preventing autoimmune diseases, 
It means dampening down inflammation when you get too much infection. It also means things like fighting cancer, and it means fighting aging. It means improving your repair mechanisms. So it's suddenly become a much bigger scope than we ever imagined. Um, the next book, Spoon Fed, uh, was actually um, a spin-off from uh, Food for Life, um, because when I handed in Food for Life, it was like a three-volume set, and my publisher nearly fell over when they saw it. It says, far too big. No one's ever going to buy this. Uh, you know, people like little, small, uh, handy guides. Um, so, w actually, um, we re we worked it and took the bits about the food industry, um, about how we'd been misled about food, um, and how, in a way, the science has become distorted over the last 50 years, uh, and that's really about that's that's where that comes into it. Now, I started to introduce the concept also of personalized nutrition, the idea that we all respond very differently to the same foods and how this could be leading to something much bigger. And it also addressed for the first time the idea of reductionism, why we dumb down science and We've treated nutrition like it's some um, really low down, it's not a real science, it's not like physics or chemistry or maths or um, even medicine. It's just something that can be dumbed down into calories, uh, fats, vitamins. You know, everyone can do it. it, it you, know, you don't need a, a degree to do it, it's so simple. And of course, and you just replace those with tablets and things like that and you're fine. And of course, that's been one of the major problems. And it's one of the things I'm constantly facing. And you, everyone, all of you who, who go out there and read other books and look at uh, the internet, will see reductionism everywhere. Everyone will say, you know what? Of the 30,000 chemicals in food, you need to worry about this one. You need to worry about lectins. You need to worry about... Um, you know, um, sulforaphanes, you need to worry about um, resveratrol, you need to worry about allicin, you need to worry about, you know, whatever it is the flavor of the moment, and they're ignoring the other 29,999 compounds that uh, we're talking about, and probably many more. And so it's this reductionist idea that has got us into this pickle, because and the reason is there's vested interest, because if you can say it's all due to this one chemical, it's very easy to make, go to a nice uh, Chinese factory that produces most of the supplements in the world, get them to produce these in a nice capsule, get a marketing campaign, put it on the back of a bus, and suddenly you've got, you know, well woman, well man, uh, with our latest, uh, you know, um, health-busting uh, remedy. And people like a simple, we love a simple solution. Um, and so uh, it's no secret that there isn't a simple solution at the very end of this. Okay, uh, There's no tablets outside with these magic supplements that I can sell you. Well, that would be very easy to make lots of money that way. Um, so that's all this sort of took me to why write uh, Food for Life. And I think... What I wanted to do was a practical guide to uh, choosing the right food. We talked about the theory. People said, yes, I understand generally the microbiome. I understand generally why we've been misled about food. But, you know, what do I do? Uh, how do I actually pick my foods in, in great detail? And people said to me, you know, which, which breads do I pick? Uh, what do I do? You know, which is the best fruit? Um, which, uh, you know, what about... Uh, milks, uh, you know, is cheese good or bad for you? Um, and I think that's why I, I said, okay, well, let's, let's look at all the evidence in great detail rather than being vague, something that everyone can uh, use and store in their brain when they go shopping. And as I did it, I learned so much. Uh, and I think it's also important to realize I'm doing this not 
in the way that the government does it, try to say for everybody this is true, but also for individuals at different times of ages. You know, uh, men and women, different um, hormonal uh, milieu, old age. Uh, you know, also the ethical dilemmas of foods. Do you want to buy foods that uh, use slave labor? Uh, if there's a, an e a choice that doesn't use slave labor and doesn't encourage it, probably we do, but we don't often think about it. Uh, do we want to uh, do things that are always healthy? Yes, probably we do, but we're often misled about it. Um, what about looking after your gut microbes? Yeah, we'd love to know that. So how, often it's not on the pack, how do you know? Uh, and particularly relevant now, and it's got more relevant in the six years I've been writing this thing, is the environment climate change, people weren't talking about it four or five years ago, nearly as much as they're talking about it now. Everybody wants to know uh, about uh, the environment. And I think what I've discovered in my journey is that the most important uh, choices you can make for the planet are the foods you eat. And that as individuals, far more important than whether you uh, go to Tenerife on your holidays or you go to uh, Devon. It's not about, you know, whether you have a Range Rover or a smart car. It is about how much meat are you going to eat. That is the number one uh, consideration, and there's many others down the line, but if you had to just do one, it's how much red meat am I going to eat and what's my contribution to climate change. And as we discussed, there's many other nuances within that for people who might not already eat much red meat. They go down to the next level and say, okay, what should I do? Uh, when we're going to discuss things about fish and we're going to discuss things about um, processed foods and, uh, and, and milks and, uh, you know, and there's all, all kinds of dilemmas about, you know, we love avocados, they're healthy, but, you know, do they have environmental issues? And how do you balance them up? So what are...